Hello, everyone. Welcome to Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. On this edition of Other Voices, we'll take a look at some of the history of activist organizing here on the peninsula, with the hope that it can inform many of our current activities. Joining me to talk about this history is well-known local activist Lenny Siegel, who was a leader in the anti-Vietnam War protests at Stanford University in the 1960s and 70s. Lenny has just published a memoir of that period entitled Disturbing the War, the inside story of the movement to get Stanford out of Southeast Asia, 1965 to 1975. And I happen to have a copy of the book right here. It's the first time I've uh, shown a, an ebook on this uh, program, but that is the nature of the way things go these days. Uh, Lenny was a leader of the Stanford chapter of Students for a Democratic Society, the Stanford Anti-Draft Union, the April 3rd Movement, the list is a long one. And of course, he has remained a leading activist in our local community to this day. I certainly have collaborated with him on a lot of projects. He, uh, his act actions uh, to the current day include a stint as a member of the Mayor Mountain View City Council and a year as Mayor of Mountain View. Lenny Siegel, welcome to Other Voices. Good to see you. Glad to have you here. I have dropped my mouse, pardon me, folks. <laughs> Lenny, um, congrats on, on uh, publishing the new book. And um, I wanna ask uh, to get started, is this uh, something that's been a long time coming or is this a result of uh, the lockdown from the pandemic? So this is a, has been a long time in coming. I, I started working on this uh, maybe uh, 40 years ago, uh -huh. uh, but uh, I was too busy organizing over the years to, to write it down. Uh, found some time over this past year. Um, I, it grew up, I, I guess it grew out of the oral history project that some of us did with Stanford, uh -huh. uh, where I recorded eight hours of uh, oral history. And I said, gee, that's probably the book. But I actually found out that by consulting the documents that I collected over the years and the Stanford Daily Archives, I needed to correct uh, some dates and some information. Uh, so it's uh, not only my memory, but uh, well-grounded in, in documents. Yeah, it is well documented. There's uh, quite a lot of um, original source material in there, including, um, and I, I don't have any of these graphics, but a lot of the old protest posters and um, someone has done a good job of archiving all this stuff. Is, was that the A3M folks who mostly did So that? I did that with the help of Jeff Kane and Martin Gorfinkel. Wow, that's terrific. That's terrific. So. I, I guess I'll just put it blank, uh, bluntly this way. Why did you write this book? Well, first, I enjoy telling old anti-war stories. Uh -huh. but, but beyond that, um, I think there are many lessons to be learned from what we did at Stanford. Uh, today, when we organize, we have digital tools that we hadn't invented yet back then. And yet the the concepts of organizing, the research, the education, the interplay between that and direct action, um, those are, are, are really important. And I think a lot of people miss those today. Uh, you don't just go out in the streets, you gotta do your homework and you gotta, you gotta win people over. So we started out as a relatively small group of activists at Stanford uh, against the war. And we basic, basically won over the majority of the Stanford community to the notion that Stanford was part of the war machine and the Stanford trustees were autocrats. And that's exactly what we're gonna get into in a minute, but I, I had one other question based on uh, showing the cover here, uh, lest I be accused of judging a book by its cover. Can you tell us the story of the, uh, the photo on the cover here? It's obviously So this was sort of a trial run. This was a tour of the Stanford Research Park that I led. Uh, I'm holding the bullhorn. Uh, during, I think it was April of 1969. Uh, in May, we returned and blocked the streets and ended up after the police charged, breaking a lot of windows. Uh, I'm known for having thrown a police tear gas canister into SRI's counterinsurgency offices. Uh, kind of on your own counterinsurgency. 
May 16th, 1969. And, and as I recall, tell in the book, that's what kept me out of the draft. It was doing that. Yeah, that, that was an interesting story because uh, you were a, a felon or something. You weren't worthy to serve in the army because you threw some tear gas back. Well, I was awaiting trial for a year, uh, starting the point at which uh, I received my induction notice. And uh, so I, I found the correspondence where I gleefully wrote the, the selective service system that I couldn't possibly report for induction because I was awaiting trial. <laughs> How convenient. <laughs> so uh, well, that's what, you know, I had long hair at the time and that's why I didn't wear a hood because uh, I, I wanted to be seen. Uh -huh. All right. Yes. Act publicly. So I, I want to start this with your, your earliest days uh, at Stanford. And, and you were drawn by uh, this concept that uh, one of the uh, major faculty people at Stanford, uh, Frederick Terman, was, was putting out talking about a community of technical scholars. And this was really the beginnings of, of Silicon Valley. And your, your research and your anti-war activism kind of led you to have a better understanding of what this community of technical scholars, uh, drawing off the old uh, phrase of a community of scholars. Talk about what, you, what that community of technical scholars is, the system that Fr Frederick Terman set up that kind of led to Silicon Valley. Well, basically the idea that Terman brought to Stanford after World War II was that Stanford would strengthen its electri electrical engineering and other technical departments and encourage faculty members. And the model was Hewlett and Packard. I'm not faculty members, uh, graduate students in that case, but also faculty members too, to set up companies that would use the technology and the graduates from Stanford uh, to produce electronics. And then they provided them with the place to lease on the Stanford land, what's now called the Stanford Research Park. Back in the day, it was the Stanford Industrial Park. And Stanford was a, was a global model for connecting the university and industry. Uh, and the thing, and, and I read about that when I was in high school and I found it, I found it was very um, appealing. I wanted to, to be a major in physics and work with computers because that's what I was doing in high school. And so, but when I got to Stanford, I learned that there was a, an unspoken partner and that was the Department of Defense because the Department of Defense was basically funding the engineering departments at Stanford. And most of the jobs at that time and most of what we now call Silicon Valley was all about military contracts, Lockheed, FMC, Westinghouse, and some of the companies in the Stanford Industrial Park like Applied Technology and Watkins Johnson. And yeah, I, I think a lot of people don't have uh, an understanding of the, uh, the history of the Bay Area really as a, a major military um, outpost. Um, I, I remember doing an interview with, uh, I think it was NBC, they were doing a local special a couple of years ago and they were talking about the history of uh, so much military mobilization here here in the Bay Area, uh, from a major shipping point for World War II to all these military contracts in Silicon Valley. So you got to Stanford and, and learned that uh, it wasn't just a community of technical scholars, it was a community of technical scholars and the, and the Pentagon. And I, I take from your book, you made this kind of a at least for yourself, how you approached opposing the, the war. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I didn't want to be part of the war effort. I didn't want to be drafted and I didn't want to go work, work for Lockheed or applied technology. So um, I basically let myself get kicked out of school because I didn't see much hope uh, for civilian work in technology. It turned out I was wrong. Some of my friends invented the personal computer and the internet. But uh, back then it was, it was you know, Lockheed had 30,000 employees here making <laughs> missiles mostly. Uh, and this area back then had $5 billion in defense contracts annually and Stanford and the Stanford Research Institute were among the largest nonprofit recipients of defense department research and development contracts. 
And you've kind of maintained this uh, deep research as core of your of your activism. And, it, and I, I, I've kind of learned from you that uh, research is actually activism. Is that so a lot of what I do now is around housing and around environmental cleanup. Mm -hmm. And I spend a good part of my days uh, digging through documents and coming up with information that are useful to people doing organizing. And it's just, to me, it's the essence of organizing to get the facts before you go out in the streets. But once you go out in the streets and people say, and this has repeatedly happened at Stanford, people would say, we don't like what you're doing. We don't like the fact that you broke into the trustees meeting. We don't like the fact that you uh, threw rocks. We don't like the fact that you sat in uh, and, and we aren't gonna listen to you. Why did you do it? So in fact, that's why they listen to us is because we conduct, engage in direct action. So this interplay between direct action and research and education is essential. When we had sit-ins back in my day, we didn't lock the doors and keep people at, we lock them open. We used them as a base to leaflet the campus. We didn't have social media in those days. So we would hand out flyers every day from the sit-in. And we had, we had tea parties where we invited the faculty to engage <laughs> in rational dialogue. So the sit-in at Stanford was a totally different animal than what I've read about at many other places. Yeah, uh, I do wanna to get to that and, and spend some time on uh, what ultimately was, um, a moderate uh, success, moderately successful sit-in, but um, let me roll this back a little bit. I, we don't have time to go through all the great examples that, that are in your book, and I encourage people to get it, and I'll, we'll talk about where to get it uh, in a little bit, but um, I, I want to kind of focus in on a couple of major ones, and one was a series, a week-long series of protests of the military draft that took place in Oakland and uh, Stanford played a major role in, in organizing that. Talk about those efforts for a bit and especially the role of the, the draft in student organizing. Clearly that was a compelling. Um, well, you know, you know a, a, a lot of what we did as activists was for other people. We supported the civil rights movement. We sort of supported the farm workers. We wanted to stop the murder of Vietnamese. But the draft was something that affected many of us directly. We were in the target hairs of the selective service system. So uh, it, it's something that woke up a lot of people to much broader set of issues because we were subject to the draft. So we organized people to oppose the draft. There's one group that ur urged people to burn their draft cards or turn them in. Um, the group I was in, the Stanford Anti-Draft Union, uh, would counsel people about how to get out of the draft. We had the we won't go statement where people pledged not to go, go into the military or pledged not to fight in Vietnam. But after doing that for a while, we decided to confront the draft directly. And in October of 1967, we organized Stop the Draft Week. And there were basically two factions that organized that. I call them the, the pacifists and the militants. And the pacifists did the, did, you know, you basically sit down in front of the doors and the Police will walk you or carry you to the paddy wagons, and they start. They did that on Monday. On Tuesday, we had a massive mill in at the Oakland Induction Center. Uh, uh, say that again. A, a mill in. Mill in. We basically crowded the streets so they couldn't bring in the bus buses. So, so you were just milling around. Yeah, and I, we probably people built some built barricades too, but the idea was to keep the buses from coming in. Uh -huh. And there were thousands of people blocking the streets of downtown Oakland. And that was successful in blocking the, the buses from coming in for several hours. Uh, These, let, let's, uh, I'm not sure the audience has a complete picture. You're at the induction center, correct? Right. And the buses yeah. are bringing people in to be inducted into the military. Right, right. Okay. And so we did that on the Tuesday and that was so successful. People showed up on Wednesday when we didn't have anything planned. And then we had a big event on Friday and that was, uh, a major confrontation with the police forces of the region. And no, we didn't stop the draft, but uh, we made quite a dent uh, in the way people felt about what was going, going on in the Bay Area about the war. Do you think uh, you increased uh, draft resistance through these, these public actions? So a combination of the public actions and leafleting 
uh, leafleting people as they went in for their physicals or their induction. And that only led to resistance, people resisting the draft. It was a daily occurrence at the Oakland Induction Center where people would say no. But also um, people went into the military and resisted in various ways. Uh, there was a, a major change in the, in the military. You know, people, people who don't know better accuse the anti-war movement of spitting on uh, inductees, spitting on people who were in the military. In fact, after a while, the military was the source of much of the energy of the anti-war movement. Yeah, I, I recall a, a, a GI cafe in Washington, D.C., near where I, I lived in the, uh, the early 70s. I went to college in Washington myself. So a number of people from the Stanford student movement went on and worked in those cafes around the country. Yeah, these, these were set up for people in the military to come in, get away from things and kind of hear the, the truth of uh, what they were being asked to fight on behalf of. So um, I, I think that's a good point. I appreciate you bringing up the, uh, the old spitting diatribe because it, as far as I know, it's just not, just not true. Um, I found it interesting, you kind of went by it quickly, but one of the themes throughout your book is um, even within the movement, uh, very, uh, hefty, a uh, sturdy debate uh, constantly going on about tactics and things like that. You just mentioned for the, the, the draft week, stop the draft week in Oakland, it was the pacifists versus the militants. Talk a little bit about how these differences got, got ironed out and how the decision-making process was made. Well, we held our meetings in public. Uh, we, uh, whenever we, we had a sit-in, the, the decision to sit in was made by a public vote. And then every day at the sit-in, we'd have at least one more vote whether or not to leave. Uh, and uh, we had to develop a, a, a um, participation uh, sign-up list uh, because you know, you're doing these things in public. You've got you know, 1,500 uh, protesters and then hundreds of people standing around the outside. And when you're having a vote, the people who aren't part of the sit-in, the uh, you know, the, the engineering students, they vote against the sit-in. So we, we, for the AEL sit-in in 1969, that's Applied Electronics Laboratory, we had 1,400 people sign a, sign a statement of participation. And only if you sign that statement of participation uh, were you able to vote in, uh, at our meetings. But beyond that, you know, one of the things I point out in the book is that those meetings tend to be dominated by people like me who were outspoken and been, been active for a long time. And it left people behind. So what we also did is we set up small group discussions. And there's pictures of a couple of those in the book uh, where affinity groups are just circles of people talking. And so there was an opportunity for people who weren't the most militant and weren't the most outspoken uh, to let themselves be heard. And that really helped bring people along and it helped the people who were, you know, you know, charging the barricades um, know that what other people were thinking. So um, when you, you mentioned the, the sit-ins and I, I do want to spend some time on what was one of the most significant actions that, that uh, the anti-war movement at Stanford undertook. And that's what became known as the uh, A3M movement, the April 3rd movement. Um, and this was focused on the advanced electronics lab at, at Stanford University. So let's turn our attention for uh, 10 minutes or so to A3M and what was going on in uh, the advanced electronics lab and what did you ultimately end up doing about it? Well, the applied electronics lab was the, the sort of the headquarters of electronics research at Stanford. And it's the building where most of the secret that is classified electronics research was being conducted for the Defense Department. So we deliberately targeted that building, occupied it for nine days to prevent that secret research from going on. Um, and we convinced the faculty to, to vote classified research off campus. Um, faculty members um, supported some because it was part of the war also because they considered secret research antithetical to the ideas of academic freedom that, that they supported. 
Uh, many of us felt it wasn't about academic freedom, it was just about the war. But you know, Stanford SDS, Students for Democratic Society, issued a demand in October of 68 that Stanford and the Stanford Research Institute, which was a wholly owned subsidiary, get out of Southeast Asia. And on election night October of November 68, uh, election day, we marched over to the Applied Electronics Lab, had a demonstration, sort of marking the building. So when we, when we built support on campus through a series of militant actions and public forums and lots of research, uh, we ended up uh, having hundreds of people occupy that building for, for nine days. And it was, to many people, the highlight of the Stanford movement. We built a community, we baked bread, we, we took over the print shop and printed three, three quarters of a million sheets of paper. We leafleted the campus. We met with the community and we convinced people that Stanford shouldn't be part of the war. And, and first there was a student vote for that. Then there was a poll by the Stanford administration. We won over everybody, not everybody, but we won over a solid majority of the campus to our demands. And those demands also applied to the Stanford Research Institute. Uh, we were trying to get Stanford Research Institute, SRI brought closer to the university so its research could be controlled. We were unsuccessful with that, but we were successful in getting rid of classified research on campus. How did you learn about the classified research going on to begin with, if it was classified? And this goes back to your research as activism. Well, um, in a few ways there. Uh, I spent time in the engineering lab laboratory looking through the technical abstract bulletin before that was withdrawn by the Pentagon from uh, our view. Uh, <laughs> we demanded information from the Stanford administration. They issued a report called the Sponsored Projects Report. But you could go into the AEL and see that they had a sign saying, you know, you can't, you can't go beyond this point. We're doing secret research, essentially. Uh, and I think that's one of the first things I discovered when I went, got to Stanford. Um, people told me there's secret research there. Really? And yeah. So, uh, and then when we were in the building, um, we, with, we didn't look at any classified files, but on, on desks of some of the professors, there was information about the research they were doing. And not only did it say what research they were doing, but it said how they were lying about their research, <laughs> uh, that they, they were representing to the Stanford community that this had nothing to do with war. Uh, it was just uh, technical research that some, anybody could use. And so we published a pamphlet called The Goods on AEL using uh, cover stock and paper from the, the print shop at AEL and uh, <laughs> circulated 10,000 copies on campus. That's fabulous. Talk a little bit more about the print shop. I found that one of the most uh, compelling stories about this whole sit-in that um, to communicate uh, with the campus community and, and the wider world beyond campus, you set up your own kind of newspaper operation using the, the lab's print shop. Well, it, it was made easier by the fact that we discovered that the people who worked in the print shop normally uh, were um, printing some anti-sex education literature there. So it kind of justified us taking it over. So, so uh, they were doing their own little private printing. Right, right. And so, so you felt okay that if they're doing it, you, you can do it. Yeah. Right. And, and we had people who were working in movement print shops. You know, the, the slogan was freedom of the press is guaranteed to those who can run one. And so we took it over when it broke down. We fixed it. When somebody sabotaged it, we fixed it. Uh, and we used, we used their paper. But the key thing is we had the people we were sitting in weren't just sitting in the building. They, you know, we, we did have seminars and we were discussing issues and debating in meetings. But these are people who had taken time off from their classes. So every morning early, they'd take uh, stacks of, uh, it was called Declassified, which was our, our, our daily newsletter, and circulated them in the dorms and departments all over campus. Uh, it was a base for organizing, not just, a, it wasn't a barricaded building. Yeah, and uh, you did mention the, the quantity that, that you put out briefly, but I just, I want you to repeat that in case the audience missed it. How many pieces of paper did you I, print? I, I, I estimated three quarters of a million sheets of paper. 750,000 sheets of paper. Yeah. 
And, and I, th I think I still have some of the paper we didn't use. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. All right. But, but yeah. other, right. other than a handful of people who normally worked in AEL, we weren't challenged on that because it was considered educational. Okay. All right. And indeed it was. Indeed it was. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the uh, publication that you put out explaining what AEL was up to was a very significant factor in changing a lot of minds of students and faculty alike, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Let's, let's get our um, audience in on this. Folks, if you're uh, at home watching on Zoom and want to participate, just find the, uh, the hands up signal and let our director know that you'd like to participate and we will bring you on as a panelist. That means you'll be seen and heard online here. Um, your uh, screen will briefly go off and when you come back on, you will need to start your video and unmute yourself um, automatically. So you'll see the little yellow raised hand at the bottom. And if you'll go ahead and raise your hand, we'll start bringing people on. I don't see any hands yet, unless I'm looking at the wrong place. I'll just uh, let our director TD know that if somebody does raise their hand, please just go ahead and, and bring them on and I'll, I'll catch up with, with the name. Uh, outside of, uh, now A3M as it's become known uh, was, had such an impact you folks, a lot of the uh, key participants have uh, continued to, to get together uh, every 10 years on, on the anniversary of the, the sit-in. What role does, do these reunions play and what, what have you learned about your other uh, colleagues during the, from those protests in the ensuing years? Well, the first thing is that the people who went through the, particularly the educational process that we went through many, maybe most of them have stayed active uh, from AIDS research to uh, climate organizing to environment, you know, environmental cleanup. Uh, many are, have been journalists, professors, uh, but people really carried on a lot of what we learned at Stanford. Um, there was a time you know, in the seventies when I think a lot of people, um, I, I would use the term became gun fetishists and thought the revolution had come. Uh, it was nice that some of the reunion people said, well, we went a little too far then, but we're still gonna stay active. Right. And so it's, it's, it's heartwarming. And then, and then of course we debate stuff. You know, we always debated stuff. I mean, <laughs> the, 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 the whole idea that the, um, for instance, the, uh, the, there was a so-called investigative reporter from the, from the San Francisco Examiner who's, who talked about a flyer that I co-wrote and said, this is a, you know, a directive from top echelon SDS leaders. It was never adopted. We were always arguing. We had, <laughs> at that point, we had several position papers arguing all kinds of stuff. The movement was full of uncertainty, full of debate, but somehow we got things done because we did it openly and we did, did it transparently. And we're committed to make, coming together finally and, and acting together uh, on, on those areas where, where you could agree uh, and, and create a very powerful movement as a result. Okay, we have uh, Sharon Minsuk online here, ready to, Sharon? Hi. Um, this, your is question? A, this is just a minor question about a minor point, but going back to something you said earlier about the, um, the pacifists versus the militants. And mm -hmm. um, Paul used the, he used the phrase, pacifists versus the militants, but I, I wanted some clarity on whether there was really one versus the other, or was it just that there were different tactics and you deploy them on different days in, in a coordinated way? We, we had some serious arguments. Uh, people like Roy Kepler really were against the, the more militant tactics we were planning for Tuesday. Uh, but uh, we, so we, we, we cut the baby in half. We, okay, you, you can do your demonstration on your day and we'll do ours on our day. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, you know, you know, I talk about differences within the movement, but compared to what we were opposing, we were out, we were, you know, we were, we were comrades. 
you know, and we just had a different approach to getting things done. Exactly. That's yeah, I, I use verses just kind of a, a shorthand. It's probably, uh, I, I shouldn't have done that, but having been through a lot of these debates as well, it's um, not that it's us versus them, but two viewpoints clashing and, and until, it gets, until it gets straightened out. Thank you for your comment. And I see we're bringing on, I gotta get closer, Joan. That's Joan, Joan Berdofsky. Okay. Hey, Joan. Joan, welcome. Hey, yeah, it's nice, nice to see you on the screen again, Wendy. Hi. <laughs> uh, I, I, I might've missed something. I got on about five minutes after you started, but I'm curious about when did you enter Stanford and uh, when did you start doing some protesting and what did Stanford do about it and when? And uh, then when did your activism, direct activism at Stanford stop and how? <laughs> Can that all be put in about one minute? So I entered Stanford in the fall of 1966 as an undergraduate. And the first time I was not allowed to register uh, because of um, breaking into a board of trustees meeting was uh, in the spring of 1969. And after that, I would get a, a notice uh, from the Judicial Council or the administration uh, charging me with things that would lead to my suspension, whether I was there or not. I was what you call a usual suspect. Uh, but I remained uh, active at Stanford uh, through the end of the war. Uh, but um, I think the the confrontations, the last major confrontation we had where hundreds of people were arrested uh, in El Camino, uh, El, El, I think it was El Camino and Embarcadero, um, that was in, in the spring of 1972. Uh, as the, uh, the war calmed down, uh, I guess we had a big demonstration after the Christmas bombing. Uh, that was what, 70, 73. So, so we stayed active, uh, but, but more and more, I was uh, at the Pacific Studies Center doing research uh, on this stuff, coming back to campus, but, but less connected to the campus. And I, I want to follow up. It's such a, a good question. Uh, she also asked uh, kind of when you became an activist, but you kind of arrived at Stanford from an activist family background, didn't you? Absolutely. I, I, Talk about that a little I, bit. You know, I tell people I've you know been working for civil rights for six decades, and I'm 72. So I I started out as a, an activist teenager, uh, took part in anti-war demonstrations in the Los Angeles area, registered voters in Watts in in 1964. So I came to Stanford with two goals: to organize and to get a degree in physics or computing. And I found that, that for a while that those seemed incompatible. And you ended up with a, an advanced degree in organizing. Yeah, I, my, okay. I use I, one of the reunions. I spot, you know, I, I was telling people my parents always wanted me to finish Stanford, but it was still uh, there. <laughs> you didn't finish Stanford; it's still there. Well, we had a guest, Mark Weiss, who has disappeared. If you want to, oh, Mark, there you are. Unmute yourself. Hey, Mark. Mark, you're muted. There you Hi, go. Hi, Lenny. Hi, Mark. Mark is one of the co-authors of the flyer I mentioned. And he's also the, the, one of the playwrights for Alice in Rotsy Land, which was the most successful uh, riot-inducing play I've ever heard of. Well, terrific. Well, welcome, Mark. Thank you, Thank yeah. you for uh, logging in. What's your yeah, question? They, yeah. yeah, I got very excited when Lenny was talking about the goods on AEL. And I, and I assume it's in the book with it. I can still remember that when the, the day the um, faculty senate met, uh, to discuss the issue of what to do about secret research on campus. And we marched in and handed out the, uh, the goods on AEL. And, uh, and in that meeting, they did then they voted to end secret research. So I quote you in the book from your oral history on that. <laughs> you, didn't, you, you didn't check quotes with you, Mark? <laughs> no, I haven't seen the book yet. I'm excited to read it. Yeah, so yeah. so I, I mentioned the, the, the play so during the Cambodia strike, or actually just before the Cambodia strike, when we were fighting against ROTC on campus, uh, Mark and Jeff Blum uh, wrote a play called Alice in Rotsyland. And the star in that play was Sigourney Weaver. And 
that play was uh, performed a few times, including uh, one night in Frost Amphitheater in front of thousands of people and thousands of people. I mean, although I'm, I'm the one who said, let's go and do something. Uh, it was the, the, the play and, it, and it, its militant parody of a Beatles song that led people out marching on ROTC. I, you I'm want to talk to about that, Mark? <laughs> yeah, have... we did. Uh, I was going to say, we had this when one, two, three, four, we are bringing home the war, five, six, seven, eight, nine, revolution. <laughs> and uh, 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 then we all marched three, of the 5,000 people in Frost Stamp Theater, 3,000 marched out and rioted all night on the campus. They had to bring police from the entire San Francisco Bay Area. It was, uh, it was like maybe the biggest overall chaotic event Stanford ever had. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. That's amazing. I'm going to have to go back and check the internet movie database because I don't think uh, Alice in Razzi Land is listed on uh, Sigourney Weaver's um, previous performances. No, at, well, I'll tell you what, though, she uh, uh, it, it was a really big deal for her. And, and about a decade later, when she became a movie star and they did a, a article about her in Time magazine, and she said in the interview that one of her proudest moments was playing the lead in this anti-war play at Stanford. All right. All right. Well, Mark, thanks so much for bringing that story to us. All uh, right. Well, before I go, I just want to uh, thank uh, Lenny for, uh, you know, he mentioned Pacific Study Center where we started in 1969. And he has kept alive this whole tradition and this uh, story that came out of this movement and the big impact that it had, including it transformed Silicon Valley from a place that was all war research mm -hmm. either to a, a place, uh, you know, the, the, that we know today in terms of peaceful applications of science and technology. All right. Good message. Good message. All right. Who's up next? Richard Engel is, I see, is. Hello. I guess you can hear me. I don't know. I'm, I'm not so used to Zooming, but even after a year. <laughs> I, I love seeing Lenny. This is such an amazing thing. I was one of the people that learned to print in the basement of AEL. Oh, yeah. I was a graduate student in political science, but I hated being a graduate student. I wanted not, I didn't want not to go to Vietnam. And I had failed to get a clear deferment. Um, so I just thought, well, I'll just play it getting a PhD. But I learned to print, which was a skill that I actually made a living with most of my working life <laughs> since, since 1906. Well, actually later than that. But uh, that print shop was such an amazing activity center. There were probably a half a dozen or more of us. There were women and men students uh, who were down there running these presses day and night. I can't remember what all we did, but it was just fantastic to see your face. And I know you worked on the Pacific research thing all these years. I've heard your name and it's been in the back of my mind. It's great to see you and to say hello. I, I wasn't a face in the movement. I was one of those people who worked in the basement. And that's where I like being. I didn't want to hold the microphone. But boy, you could, you could throw some grenades from a printing press that was pretty effective, I thought. <laughs> I loved it. A a absolutely. You know, one of the things about AEL, it was not a top down situation. We had a coordinating committee, but right. the, the committee that wrote the newsletter and the people that ran the print shop, they were pretty much on their own. We didn't, you know, the people who were meeting in the coordinating committee didn't tell them what to do. It was, it was, you know, if you're an anarchist, this is, this is kind of your, your, your best form of organization. To not much of it. <laughs> that building was a very exciting place because there are all these great people. I don't know if I should mention names, but there were some people who were like Bruce Franklin and people who were unknown and very, very vocal, powerful organizing people against the war. And a lot of us didn't have that kind of voice, but we could pitch in and, and do this sit in. It was fun. We, we had a, I would say, a very deep bench. We had a lot of people with a lot of skills, whether it was baking bread or running a print shop or writing a press release. So there were a handful of people that were known publicly, but we had a whole lot of people who made the thing work. Yeah. And that's, that's as true today. Uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for your work on behalf of the movement down there in that basement. I, I gotta ask you, do you think Lenny's uh, estimate of 750,000 pieces of printing went out of there is pretty accurate, Richard? 
I, I, I can't, this, there was a room where the presses were, which were really simple duplicators. Um, and then there was other rooms where they stored the basically eight and a half by 11 reams and cases and cases. And they were sending these reports, I guess, off to Washington. And those rooms were empty by the time we left. I don't know who was in there. Maybe that sounds good to me as a printer. I'd say you're pretty good, Lenny. And then also people were bringing paper in from all the other departments. Like people would cop reams of paper from their department office and bring it to the, over to AEL. <laughs> so it was, it was a neat, and it was, I guess for anybody who's much younger, it'd be hard to realize, but this really was the only way to get the word out back in those days. I thought That's it was great. Well, thanks so much for joining us and uh, sharing some of your memories. And, um, and I'm glad we could Thank you guys uh, for putting this together again. Really really years. Years. So uh, we've got a couple more hands up. If we can bring on, uh, looks like Judy Rock and then Arjang. And I'm not seeing much movement going on here. Well, we're waiting for uh, our next guest to, to be brought on uh, screen. Lenny, Lenny, let me ask you um, what you're mostly involved in uh, these days. So I, I'm, I'm, besides the book, um, I'm, you know, I, back in 69, we started working uh, on the need to provide workforce housing for people at Stanford and the peninsula. And I'm still working on that today. Uh, that's why I got elected to the Mountain View City Council and was elected in 2014, served for four years, still working on those issues as a community organizer. So I'm working on housing, um, starting around uh, early 1980s, working with another AEL veteran, uh, Ted Smith, helped form the Toxics Coalition. And so uh, a lot of my paid work for the last 25 years was uh, helping communities confront toxic contamination uh, a lot of that from the military. Uh, and uh, what's what, one of the strange things that I mentioned in the book is I became a constructive partner of the Defense Department and helped get Defense Department money contracts, uh, but for environmental cleanup. For environmental cleanup, yeah. yeah. Great. And so so those are the, the kinds of things that, I, that I'm working on today. All right. Um, have you had it with uh, politics or might there be another uh, run for office in your future? Um, I've lost twice lately, so I'm probably not going to run again. I'm just going to keep organizing. All right. We like you in the streets with us. As, as good a mayor as you were in city council. You know, you're talking in the streets. I should have mentioned, you know, in 1991, some of us formed Mountain View Voices for Peace. When Trump was elected, it became Mountain View Voices for Peace and Justice. And we've been doing demonstrations at the corner of Castro and El Camino since 91 on and off. Yep. The Persian Gulf War, the Gulf War, immigration. Uh, this last weekend, it was support of Asian Americans. And the work goes on. Okay, April Eiler, welcome. What's your question or comment? Oh, you're muted, April. Unmute. Lower left hand corner. Okay. There you go. Hi. Hi. Um, I worked at Stanford in, in the Dean of Students office in 1968 and 69. And I knew you, Lenny Siegel, but you probably didn't know me. And I often said I became the house mother of the SDS and the um, and the Black Panthers because I was living in the basement of the of the women's clubhouse, the, and uh, when they occupied the student union, they all came into my building, and I worked with um, Rabbi Famelant and Father Durier and Alan Strain and with all the um, all the religious people, and I was very much aware of what you all were doing. And I was later very happy to find out that you became the mayor of, of Mountain View. And of course, I've always known um, Paul George because I've been part of Peninsula Peace and Justice. And I just wanted to stop in and say hello to all of you 
and how happy I am that you are both doing everything that you're doing. Well, thank you, April. That's Lenny, all. <laughs> Lenny, you seem to be evoking a lot of nostalgia today, too. <laughs> well, you know, other people have stories to tell. You know, Mark yeah. participated in the Our History Project, but, but you know, there's, you know, I l learned some things from people who weren't part of our movement. I tell a story in the book when I was active in Mountain View politics in the, in that must have been uh, the late 70s, early 80s, I met Walter Hewlett, Bill Hewlett's son. And we got to talking about Stanford. And there was an event on March 11th, 1969, where five members of the Board of Trustees were on a, a panel versus uh, several students. And that was a turning point in the Stanford movement. Bill Hewlett said, the company he was on the board of didn't make nerve gas. And it turned out that's because they just sold the, the plant to the government. And I found out from Walter Hewlett that that turning point was also a turning point for, for Bill Hewlett. He became much more rigid in his right wing politics as a result of the confrontation with the students that day. So it's always interesting to hear what people who were coming from different perspectives back then uh, remember about those days. Yeah, yeah. People do like to tell stories and you've told a lot of great stories in here. Uh, I, I do encourage people to, uh, to get the book. And uh, again, I, I've got a note here to tell people how to, how to get that, but obviously the, the digital copy is available at Amazon. That's the only place the digital is, is available. Uh, can you explain where it's available uh, in hardcover? If people well, don't basically, to... you order it from your favorite bookseller. Um, there's a, you know, there's a collection of, you know, I prefer the independent stores. Um, and you, you tell them the name of the book and you can order it. Uh, it's actually fairly simple. Uh, I don't think it's, you know, people aren't going into bookstores very much these days. So uh, I don't think many bookstores have ordered a stack of them yet. But, uh, but it's pretty easy to order from any online bookseller. Okay, uh, well, I'm going to put in a, a plug for a local bookseller who's been very supportive of the Peace and Justice Center for a long time. Reach and Teach up in San Mateo has uh, online book ordering, any book you want to get. I checked their website before coming here. They can get Lenny's book. So folks, if you want to visit shop.reachandteach.com, uh, Craig and Derek would be Thrilled to sell you as many copies of Lenny's book as, as uh, you want to order. Shop.reachandteach.com. Independent, peace, and justice-oriented uh, gifts and books and games uh, store, especially for kids up in uh, San Mateo. Shop.reachandteach.com. Okay, our next guest is, is Jay Rock, but it's Steve Rock. Welcome, Steve. Hi. I was at Berkeley during that time, the 60s, and uh, I was wondering if there's any coordination or communication between the movement in Berkeley and the one in Stanford. I was only peripherally involved uh, in, in Berkeley, but I don't remember any uh, information or uh, discussion going on about what was going on at Stanford at all. Uh, but maybe there was that uh, was going on. Uh, could you comment so, on that? so stop, stop the draft week was uh, spearheaded by activists from Ber UC Berkeley, Stanford, and San Francisco State. And uh, there were times where we went to demonstrations at each other's campuses as well. But during uh, on the May sixteenth, nineteen sixty nine demonstration uh, that we had at SRI, um, that was the same time as People's Park. So we helped each other out by, by uh, spreading the, the police responsibilities out. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so there was some coordination, uh, but uh, Berkeley is a much bigger school and had a bigger movement. Anything else, Steve? Thank you. Yeah, I- Oh, one, one, one more thing. Uh, Steve Weissman, who was a leader at Stanford, particularly of the 1968 Old Union sit-in, had been a leader of the free speech movement. Okay. okay. Uh, and one other question. Go ahead. Uh, at that time, Panofsky was head of Slack, and he was 
kind of defying defying the uh, Atomic Energy Commission and spoke out against the war. Did you have any coordination with him? So I actually tell a story in the book. Uh, Panofsky is one of the, the people who attracted me to Stanford. Uh, but it turned out one of the things he did was uh, working for the Jason Division of the Institute for Defense Analysis, helped devise the technologies that led to the electronic battlefield. And so at one point, I, it was, I think we were sitting on a lawn in front of at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center as part of an anti-war forum, sort of. And uh, I challenged him on that. Be, you know, He felt that by providing for the electronic battlefield, he was uh, discouraging carpet bombing of North Vietnam. And I said, you're just enabling this new technology, the automated warfare, and they carpet bomb North Vietnam anyhow. So I think he made a mistake on that, but he was an insider uh, and uh, he did a lot of good stuff, but that's something I held against him. An honest answer. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, I think he was also on the board that fired Bruce Franklin or recommended the firing of Bruce Franklin. Oh boy, that was quite a controversy in and of itself on, on the Sanford campus. Okay, I think we have a couple more guests to bring on, which is good because we're getting close to running out of time here. We do try to keep this within an hour because uh, the media center is still broadcasting on local cable, even though uh, the, we are not able to get into the studio still these days. Okay, we have our next audience member here, Arjang, am yes. I saying that right? Yes, hi, thanks. Thank you. Welcome, what's your question or comment? Comments quick. Uh, first, I was very impressed and thank you for uh, all the good work you have done. I wish a lot more people would have been engaged in, and um, I'm sure we would have. Had the Did you speak up a little? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes. yes. Yeah. I said I was pretty impressed with uh, what you have done in the past and I wish we had a lot more people like you. Thank you. Uh, do you ever think back and say, oh, if I would have done something different, maybe I would have had a big, I'm not saying you didn't have impact. No, that's not the question. But do you ever look back and say, maybe if I would have done something different, um, then the impact would have been bigger? That's one question. The second one is, do you think we as a nation have learned anything from those experiences, uh, those wars? That's it. So the second thing, yeah, definitely we've learned a lot. Uh, we've learned a lot, you know, in Silicon Valley, and that people are trying to do things other than military work. We've learned a lot, but you know, there's there's more resistance to wars when this country engages with them, but we don't always stop them. Uh, it's uh, it's it's an on, you know, going to war is an ongoing controversy, but there are a lot of people, uh, a lot more people oppose every military action by this country that's unjustified than oppose the Vietnam War at the beginning. Uh, so uh, we, we've been quite successful. The thing that, that I regret, and I'm not sure it really made a difference, is for a short period of time, I, I was kind of um, just looking down on the students who, who weren't activists. Um, you know, and a lot of people did this. Well, you know, we're revolutionaries, we're radicals, and you people are just going to school. And the real people reading the, leading the revolution are the Black Panthers or the Vietnamese or you know, people of color, whatever. And in fact, if you're, organize, if you're on a campus and you're organizing students, you have to recognize that most of them are indeed students most of the time. And you have to respect that. And that's something that for a short while, I, I feel like I, I got away from. I, you know, they, you know, during the 1968 sit-in, successful sit-in, um, we, we won the right to take our midterms that we'd missed during the sit-in. And so I went to the physics library and found out that other than my roommate, all the other students in my classes spent all their time in the physics library. And I had to recognize they were, they were at Stanford to go to school. And to the degree we got them out in the streets or into buildings to sit in, that was success. But again, they were students. Those were uh, good questions, Arjang, and I, I appreciate them. I, I wanna respond to the uh, question about has the country learned any lessons um, going back to, to Vietnam. And I think that one of the things that has always struck me that has been kind of a, a verifier of the powerful impact of the anti-war movement uh, as it related to the war in Vietnam 
was after the uh, Persian Gulf War in 1991, George H.W. Bush found it necessary to declare that America had finally kicked the Vietnam syndrome as if anti-war was uh, some kind of uh, disease. But he acknowledged, I, I think that statement acknowledged that the anti-war movement had forever changed the way the US public approaches wars. And as Lenny just rightfully pointed out, everyone since then has been massively protesting. So I, I think that is one of the longest lasting impacts of the anti-war movement um, in, from the 1960s and, and 1970s. You know, it, it turns out that there are a group of people like us who are almost always against war and there are a group of people that are almost always for it. And there was a group of people in the middle who want a quick victory. And if they get a quick victory like they claimed in, in the, with the Persian Gulf War and people are for it. But as the wars drag on, people are against it. And that's what we're seeing today in Afghanistan where uh, a lot of people supported it because of 9-11. Uh, but people don't wanna be in Afghanistan. What are we doing there? That's right. That's right. Okay, uh, I don't know that we have any other guests coming on, uh, audience members coming on or... Uh, There's a name there on the screen. Okay. Well, it has disappeared from my screen. So I guess maybe that means they're in, in transit. We'll give them uh, just a couple more seconds. We're almost out of time here anyway. Um, maybe TD can... Let me know via chat if somebody is coming. Well, one of the, one of the problems with Zoom is I cannot con communicate with my control room people. Ah, there we go. Oh, and it's Paul Gilbert. Paul, uh, unmute yourself, please, Paul. You're muted. Unmute your uh, down in the lower left corner. There we go. There we go. Welcome, Paul. It's great to see you. Paul Gilbert is a, a longtime former uh, member, but a longtime member of the Peace and Justice Center's Board of Directors. Great to see you, Paul. Uh, a comment, I was, I was at graduate school at Berkeley uh, in that uh, period, and um, I got close enough to uh, listen to the speeches at Sproul Plaza and uh, sometimes uh, smelling the uh, at tear gas, so I figured that's time to go home. Um, but uh, I've just appreciated your work, Minnie, and uh, I, I live in Mountain View, and I voted for you every time. I don't know what those other folks were thinking. <laughs> uh, and uh, I didn't get the name of the book. I, I do my, I buy my books on Castro Street, and uh, I want to just get the name so I can get, find it easily. It's called Disturbing the War. The Inside Story of the Movement to Get Stanford University Out of Southeast Asia, 1965 to 1975. I have found that um, at, at the Reach and Teach uh, shop, just searching for Disturbing the War, uh, I don't think there's another book out there uh, with that title. So Disturbing the War, and you can always uh, search on Lenny's, Lenny's name as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, mostly, I just wanted to say thank you, uh, Lenny. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks. Uh, Lenny, just very quickly, where does the term disturbing the war come from? So uh, I was arrested for essentially disturbing the peace. It's a little longer than that in May, May 16th, 1969, for the, when I threw the tear gas canister into the building. Uh, but we weren't disturbing the peace. We were disturbing the war. All right. It's that simple. And, right. you, know, you know, one of the things that I try to do in the book is you know, we, we did some militant stuff and we did a lot of scholarly stuff, but we also had a sense of humor. And uh, you, if, if you read the book, you'll see a number of things that we did uh, that may surprise you because it's not the kind of things that the press always reported. Okay. Lenny Siegel, uh, author of the brand new Disturbing the War, the inside story of the movement to get Stanford, out of, Stanford University out of Southeast Asia and a continuing local activist here in Mountain View. Thanks so much for joining us. I really- Thanks for having me, Paul. Okay. And to our audience members, thank you for attending. And uh, as always, we will be sending out a follow-up email. We'll follow up with some links where to get Lenny's book. 
uh, and maybe some other uh, links that, that Lenny will share with us. Uh, we'd like to send out a- there, there, there is a link that's given in the book to the, uh, to, so you can access directly some of the docu the doc many of the documents in the book, as well as the better versions of the graphics. Okay, I'll huddle with you for what we should send out to, to our audience. Lenny, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Take care now.